All right. Uh, welcome. Does, uh, do you have a, uh, does Sora have an opening statement you'd like to make or would we go straight Dr. to questions? Uh, Dr Larry Marshall, Chief Executive CSIRO, I, I, I do chair if there's time. Uh, they, they, I'm not sure how long it is, but they, there is time if, uh, if it's not too long, Dr Marshall. Thank you, Chair. Just quickly then, Chair, since we last met, Team Syro has been busy collaborating across the system to turn Australian science into solutions that benefit all Australians. We're going to be creating Australia's most advanced model for predicting and beating bushfires in collaboration with the Rural Fire Service or collaborating across the agricultural system to deliver new strains of drought resistant wheat or releasing a landmark study in partnership with the Centre for Invasive Species on, on preserving Australia's biodiversity. We're working broadly across sectors to catalyse innovation and deliver impact. Our vision is to create a few, better future for all Australians by helping all parts of our world-class research sector to better connect with industry so that we can get more brilliant inventions out of the lab and into our lives. We're proud to work with every major Australian university and to manage national labs to help supercharge Australia's research. We recently added a new lunar test bed to help researchers and businesses preparing to head to the moon. And we look forward to working with universities to access our test lab facilities as part of the Trailblazer program. We also work with thousands of businesses across every sector to drive sustainable innovation and growth. For example, together with Commonwealth Bank, we're combining climate and financial data to help boost resilience to climate risk in the financial sector. And under a new five-year arrangement with Boeing, we're collaborating to create a more sustainable aviation industry. Our purpose is to solve Australia's greatest challenges, and so we're always looking ahead to capture opportunities for the nation. With the establishment of the National AI Centre, we're laying the foundations for an Australian AI and digital ecosystem. Thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Cinder Chisholm? I'm happy for Senator Cox to start. Senator Cox. Oh, thank you. Um, my first questions are for, um, in relation to GM Cotton and the Fitzroy River catchment. Uh, how long has Syro been working on the developing of GM Cotton? Senator, I think that's one for Kirsten Rose, actually. So, excuse me, Kirsten Rose, Executive Director of Future Industries. Uh, Senator, I don't have that data at hand. If you can give me a little bit more detail about what you're looking for, perhaps I can take it on notice. How long, how long have they been working on the development of genetically modified cotton? That was the question. Um, right. se Senator, sorry, I, I didn't realise you're talking about GMO. Um, yeah. I, I think we can answer our breeding programs for cotton, um, which we've been doing cotton breeding for probably more than 50 years. But I'm not aware of, because our breeding is, you know, we breed different strains of cotton, um, but I'm not sure that would, is what you're asking. You're asking about genetic modification, which... Has there been I, a time frame that understand. you've been working on it? Like, is there a... I'm, I'm, I'm not able to answer. I'm not aware of that, Senator, so I have to take that on notice. But I. I I, I, I probably would know if it was if it was significant. All right. And how many variants of GM cotton are there that have been developed by Styro? Senator, I, if you're going to ask me about genetic modification, again, I'll, I'll have to take it on, on notice. But there are many varieties of cotton that we breed and wheat and many crops. And basically, we breed them to uh, reduce the impact of drought. Or, for example, wheat today has a 30% higher yield than it would otherwise due to the effects of climate change because we bred new strains, but that wheat is not genetically modified. It's, it's genetically bred, if, yep. if that makes sense. So, so I just want to be clear, you're talking about um, actually changing the, the, the genetics of the, um, of the material through breeding. You're talking about um, interfering with the genetics. You're talking about changing them through some mechanism other than breeding. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay, I'd have to take those questions on notice. So yeah, no. if you could provide that, that'd be great. And also, if um, Zoro actually gets a royalty from GM Cotton, that would be great if you're able to give me on that on notice as well. Um, my next questions are in relation to the Gas Industry Social and Environmental Research Alliance. 
That's right. uh, Jazeera editor. And uh, Dr. Mayfield is in the best position to answer that. Uh, so, Senator uh, Peter Mayfield, Executive Director for Environment and Energy Resources. So, uh, happy to answer your questions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I just want to note that in relation to the Progress for, um, Report on Groundwater Baseline Study for the Canning Basin, um, can you tell me which oil and gas companies are currently part of the alliance? This is for Gisera you're asking for? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Uh, so we have Origin, uh, Santos, uh, Queensland Gas Corporation and um, APIR are there. I think that's everyone. Okay. How much money does each oil and gas company invest in um, the Alliance over the past five years? Uh, I'd have to, in terms of the past five years, I'd have to take that on notice, but um, uh, in terms of the whole Gisera program, um, it's been going for some time now and it's about fifty-four odd million dollars worth of investment to date. Uh, majority of that comes from governments, whether they're federal or state governments, and a smaller proportion of that comes from uh, companies. Okay, I understand that um, the Research Alliance account, uh, recently published the groundwater baseline study of, of the Canning Basin, um, which Syro undertook. Um, do they believe the involvement of oil and gas companies, um, particularly ones like Thea Energy, um, is a conflict of interest in developing scientific research on groundwater? Uh, so if it's done through Gisera, so I just want to make sure we're talking about the same study, because um, there's also work that's been done under the uh, Geological Bioregional Assessments Program as well, and that work is fully government funded. No, I'm talking about the, uh, the scientific framework that's being developed in relation to um, determining, uh, you know, and the baseline uh, study for groundwater in the Canning Basin. So within this report, okay. there's, uh, you know, Thea Energy are part of your actual development group of that framework. And I think I have a con significant concern when we've got a fracking company like Thea Energy mm -hmm. who will operate in the Edgar Ranges in the Kimberley who um, will determine uh, the cultural places, talk about the aquifers and the scientific research that formulates that in order for them to go in and frack country. So, Senator, in, in terms of the research that gets done through this era, so the projects that are put forward, uh, they're put forward by researchers and by community members and other relevant stakeholders, uh, and there are regional, uh, regional advisory committees, so the governance structure is quite quite clear around how those projects are selected. Um, and those advisory committees all have independent members on them who have the balance of the vote. So the selection of the projects, that's independent. The actual execution of the research is also done independently by CSIRO. So companies don't participate in the research. They get to see the outcomes of the research but it's done independently with the right level of uh, scientific rigour. Yeah, I'm not talking about the independent research, I'm talking about the development of the framework. So the framework that actually governs the, the data collection and the, uh, you know, the task outputs and deliverables of that framework. In your progress report on this, you actually highlight the different areas of baseline characterisation, characterisations of those, which continue to be an issue when we're talking about water resources in regional development because uh, they become open slather for energy and fracking companies like their energy. Um, so they're sitting at the table developing all the scientific basis in which to do this, uh, all the while crafting it along the way to be able to get access to it. Uh, so Senator, I can only talk about the work that gets done by CSIRO and that's done to ensure that we do the right scientific rigour and approach to baselining and whatever research gets done. Thank you for your answer. My only other set of questions are in relation to the Morajuka um, rock art and the report um, around has CSIRO done any, or undertaken any independent assessments of the impact of the industrial emissions from industry on the Morajuka rock art? Uh, so can you just say that name again for the rock art? Or? Murujuga, which is at the Barup Peninsula on the in Barup. the Kuba region. Yes, okay. Yep. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so there's some work 
been done on that some time ago. Um, it would probably be around about 2015 or 16, I believe. Okay. Um, can you provide any details in relation to the findings and recommendations of that work? Oh, I'd have to take that on notice, Senator. It's, um, it's something that I haven't uh, looked at for a long time. Okay. I note, it, note that there's uh, the two, 2017 uh, Senate inquiry which uncovered some evidence regarding the incorrect use of flawed studies on the impact of industrial emissions that actually um, are still up on the WA Government Department's website. Do you have any concerns with those? So, so the work that was done at the time, it was peer reviewed. Uh, we've gone through a long exercise around that, uh, around the quality of the work. And uh, we're very comfortable with the position that uh, we ended up in terms of what work was done to, I guess, um, understand the scientific rigour behind it. Um, so, so that was done back then. We're quite comfortable for it to stay there. Okay. Will there be any further work? Uh, there hasn't been any activity in that space for a number of years. So um, at this point in time, I'm not aware of any intention to do any more work. Okay. Given the, the, the changes of legislation um, in the WA state, particularly around protections of cultural heritage, but also the Jook and Gorge inquiry, the Way Forward report, uh, I thought there might be. But that's it, Chair, for me. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator. Now, Senator Rennick has to catch a plane and has asked, just for some indulgence, okay. to ask a quick question. Yeah. Uh, Senator Rennick. Uh, hi, guys. How are you going? Uh, Is that the question? No, 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 that's not the question. Uh, um, Larry, I was just going to ask you, last time in estimates you said there were 40 different climate models. I'm just curious as to which model the government will be using to determine net zero emissions. Oh, sorry, Senator. Um, are you talking about the model to actually predict um, the climate, or are you talking about the model to map the pathway to net zero? Well, well, I mean, presumably you'd have to use some of those climate models to map, to come up with a set of rules to map the pathway to net zero, wouldn't you? I mean, they, they'd, they'd depend on each other. They'd be, the model to map the way to net zero would also have to link to one of those 40 models. Yeah, Senator, I'm, I might be missing your question exactly, but um, the, the, the pathway to get to net zero, for us at least, has been about what the scientific interventions do we need to make you know, things like future feed to reduce the emissions in the cattle industry or hydrogen to reduce the emissions in energy. What kind of things do we need to create okay. so that Australia... So, so clearly there's got to be a correlation between a reduction in carbon dioxide and a reduction in temperature. Because the whole idea of reducing carbon dioxide emissions is to reduce the temperature. So at some point you've got to take the model that's used, you know, to calculate reducing carbon emissions and apply that to the model that says you know, this is how the, the temperature and this is how carbon dioxide fits into the climate model for the temperature. Right. So, so Senator, in that, in that case, if, you, if you're asking um, how long will it take to see an impact from reducing carbon emissions, we have... Oh, well, that's part of the argument, isn't it, that we've got to keep carbon emissions, you know, at certain levels to reduce or, or at least control, limit the, the temperature increase, so... Yeah, that's right, Senator, yeah. So that's more than Peter you have, I think. Sorry, what was that? I think Dr Mayfield has that, that, that information. Oh, right. OK, sorry. Yeah, so, Senator, um, so there are, there are the two different types of models. And so through the IPCC work, that's where they're using the ensemble of the 40 plus models and looking at trying to get the right sort of um, understand what the climate trajectories are. You'd be aware of um, there's the RCP pathways that they look at, and that sort of sets a range of, I guess, different pathways between CO2 and temperature rise that are understood through the IPCC work. And that's then driving the, the net zero to 2050 sort of targets that we're seeing across the, through the COP process. So the, to do the net zero work to, um, in Australia, it requires a different sort of modelling because it's all about which technologies are available to us um, to produce energy or to you know, do industrial activity that have lower emissions. Uh, the uptake of those, um, the relative advantages and disadvantages of them for those various businesses. So it's, it's, it's a different sort of model that you use to then work out what are the steps you take to get to net zero 
in the Australian context. But the IPCC work provides that guidance as to if we get these, these emissions to these levels globally, this is what we will expect to see in the climate temperature rise. And you'll be able so, to map that. Yeah. In, well, they're in, already mapped. They're already mapped. Right. And, and I guess one of the things with um, what the models show us is that there's a lot of carbon already in, in the atmosphere and in the oceans for that battle. Uh, which locks us into a trajectory where you know we're heading for one and a half to two degrees already. So that's that's assuming that there's some sort of level of reduction in emissions. So, so can you uh, can you send me that model that, that 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 sort of algorithm or the model so I can have a look at it myself? I, I don't think it's something that you could look at um, yourself. It's very complex. But well, the well, I'm, quite, I'm quite capable of solving complex simple. problems. I, I'd be fascinated yeah. by it. Um, yeah. I, I must admit, though, I'm intrigued. I would have thought if the science was settled, there would have been only one model, not 40. But anyway, I'll leave that as a, a comment. Okay, the, cheers. Thanks, the models guys. Are produced okay. by different countries. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, Cinder Walsh has a call. That I'm going to, uh, thank you, Cinder Roberts, for being patient. I, I do need to give Cinder Walsh the call and then Cinder Roberts. We do have to break for dinner at 6.30. I am keen, to the extent we can, to try and get through the next little session as quickly as possible. So if uh, if everyone could assist us on that basis, send a wash out of the call. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you, uh, Dr Marshall and all your colleagues uh, that are there for us today. Um, just a couple of questions on um, trends in your um, staffing levels, so your, your direct um, CSIRO employees. Um, are you able to tell me how many um, actual full-time equivalent um, staff you had at June 30, 2021, uh, and what that equivalent figure would be um, as close as at today as possible. And, and Senator, um, Mr. Maniard will give you that information. I um, just want to make sure I give you the right answer. So you're not looking at all of the people CSIRO employ, you're just looking at the ones that direct employment um, on our payroll and in FTE, full-time equivalent? Yeah, that's right. Your, your actual direct employees, yep. Right. Um, Senator Tom Munyard, oh, Acting yeah. Chief Operations Officer. Um, so our full-time equivalent as at 30th of June 2021 was 4,949. And what is it? 4,499? 4,949. 4,949. And as at today? Um, let me just check that figure. So our data as at 31st of December 2021 is 5,032. 5,032. Um, and was there a change to your um, ASL cap, was your cap lifted during the pandemic or something? So our similar? ASL estimate um, in 2021 was 5,351 and for 21, sorry, sorry, 5,351. Sorry. Yep. And for the 21, 22 year, it is 5,414. 5,414. 14. Yep. Um, so as at today, you're about, um, 400 below your ASL cap That's correct, for your Senator. direct CSIRO employees. Um, Dr Marshall, can you just give us some insights into why that would be the case, that you'd be reasonably significantly under your cap in terms of direct employment? Well, Senator, I, I can. Um, so um, there's a number of modes of employment um, at CSIRO and, and not all of them are um, direct um, and on payroll we have uh, affiliates and other um, mechanisms. But we tend to um, shape the organisation um, with the skills that we need to suit whatever challenges um, we think Australia is going to face and get the scientific expertise that we need. So we've been going through a number of shifts, for example, around the modern manufacturing strategy or around AI, and you may have seen um, with a number of recruiting campaigns going on at the moment to, rec to recruit talent. Um, but of course, recruiting has been incredibly difficult during COVID. 
Um, so um, but we're probably a little bit behind where we would otherwise be. But we don't we don't try to get to the max of our ASL cap. We try to choose the talent that we need or the problems that we can solve. Okay, and. When I asked the question about your direct actual um, FTE employees, you mentioned the concept of another number, which might include sort of all the people that you would describe to be, you know, working for you in various modes. I assume that includes independent contractors and labour hire and so on. Is that where you were going with that? Well, actually, a little bit broader, Senator. We also have a lot of students and postdocs, yep. some of whom are employed by uni through the university, but they work um, on our site with yeah. us. Um, and we can do postdocs. We can do either way. We can employ them directly, or we can employ them through a university. It really just depends what's best for them um, and for us and for the university. Okay. So, when you add those numbers, it, it it gets a little bit a little bit larger, um, yep. depending on how you define it. And so without taking our time to go through all of that, what's the sort of headline number that you have in mind when you're including all of those people? Oh, gee. <laughs> Tom, you might have to help yeah, me out so, here. So, Senator, if you're talking about all of our affiliates, you can talk somewhere between two and 3,000 people. An additional two, 3,000 Two people. to 3,000 yeah. people. That are, um, yeah. Okay. No problems. We may come back with some questions on notice-based Oh, based on that, but I won't go. I won't go through it now. Um, but your your answer to why you might be about 400 under the ASL cap is partly in relation to recruiting challenges in the current environment, and partly in relation to you may choose to do it a different way depending on what your priorities are. That's right, correct, Senator. Oh, yes, yes, Senator. Okay. Um, just another uh, question uh, around the number of projects that you've done uh, in um, COVID. You know, you've had a special sort of role uh, in relation to providing advice uh, during the pandemic. Do you have a number of reports that you've published in that in that special role that you've had during COVID? Um, you know, it, it, yeah, there, there, there's a range of them, Senator, that's why I'm hesitating, because we did reports on economic recovery, we did reports on, I think we even did a hydrogen report for aviation some, during that time, so, so there's a number of them that relate to recovery from the pandemic, but that's probably not answering the question you're asking. That's okay, because that, that just gives us a little bit more insight into how you sort of view things that we could put on notice. So would you, would you normally expect that government would sort of formally respond to those sorts of reports that you've done, for example, on, on economic recovery? And, and did they oh, respond? Senator, oh, Senator, we generally engage with our department um, on, on these things if they relate to things that the government would be um, needing or, or wanting, to, wanting to look at. So just on a uh, on a sort of informal basis, you might be in a meeting about something and engaging rather than sort of getting a formal response. Yeah, it depends on what it is, Senator. But our, our engagement is it's far more frequent for us to engage with the department directly. Yep. Since we're we're in that department. Okay. No no problems. That that gives us um, a little bit to go on in terms of some possible further. Um, questions on notice. I just wanted to ask you, um, Dr. Marshall, you, um, y you've you got the uh, $150 million for the CSIRO um, Innovation Fund, which is managed by um, the main sequence ventures um, as part of your sort of broader commercialisation um, program there. Uh, and um, CSIRO is also sort of, you know, renowned for having done sort of very pure research as well, which has, has led to uh, different sorts of inventions that you proudly uh, have on your website, um, uh, starting with uh, the technology underpinning, for example, Wi-Fi. Um, which I take to have come out of a more um, uh, pure research model rather than a sort of industry-linked applied model. 
Um, how important is foundational um, discovery research um, to driving ongoing innovation and commercialisation uh, in the long term? Well, it, it's very important, Senator, and one of um, one of the things that we do to start inside CSIRO is two things really. We've increased our collaboration with the university sector because there's 39 great unis and they do terrific Horizon 3 Blue Sky foundational research. So we've deepened the collaboration there. Um, and in our act, Senator, um, it does specify that um, our purpose is to help ensure translation of all Australian science, not just what CSIRO does. So that's a reason for that. And then the second one, we've we've invested a lot recently um, in what we call our future science platform. So these are the deep discovery research, the, the, the blue sky research. Um, and I think, um, and Tom will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's 150 million over the Fords, isn't it, Tom? Yeah, I think so. That sounds, that sounds in the ballpark, yeah. For what you just described as the blue sky research. Yeah, we call them our future science platforms, Senator, and, and um, hydrogen in part came out of a future science platform, our hydrogen tracker, um, we're looking at carbon locking, um, a, way to, a way to lock in carbon for a better sequestration. Um, we're looking at quantum. So these are, these are kind of right on the cutting edge. And I should say, um, they're all done in collaboration with a, a pretty big cohort of, of students and postdocs, um, often, often whom work in universities, and we're all partnered up with many of the units on this work, again, to deepen that, to deepen that collaboration. Senator, just to correct that figure, it's it's slightly above 150. It's about f just over 40 million dollars per annum for the four years. Right. Yeah. Okay. And how how does that compare then to the 150 million for the CSIRO Innovation Fund? Is that over the same sort of period? Is it, or is was that just a one-off? Uh, so the so the fund is a ten year fund, um, Senator, and um, that fund is is not for investing in CSIRO research, although although it has it can, um, but it's investing in commercialisation of broader research across the yep, whole so across the whole system. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, yep. I mean, can I just get your sort of general perspective, Dr. Marshall, on what the appropriate balance is? for our country in investing in blue sky research, as, as, as you described it, um, versus um, investing in um, research that is, that is linked to industry partners, um, even before the commercialisation phase. Um, what, what do you think the sort of the appropriate balance is and, and are we striking it? Well, Senator, I probably can't answer for the system, but I can tell you how we think about it for CSIRO. Um, and and, and that, that, that 40 million um, is ballpark rough number, about 10% of, of what we invest. I'm just pulling that number out of the air. Tom might need to check me later. Um, but but I, I think that would be fairly close to the right percentage. And and that's, if you look at, if you look, we're an industrial research agency, so we're Purpose is, of course, to trans, you know, translate and assist industry with, with Australian science. Um, if you look at a company, um, they might invest four percent or even only two percent in um, cutting-edge research. So, based on that projection, you might say so. A university would probably be something more than than what we are, um, given we're kind of in the middle between industry and and academia. If that helps you. Mm. Senator Walsh. Yeah, I'll just I'll just wrap up um, quickly, um, Chair. Okay, thank yeah. you. Um, late last year, um, the government issued new directions for the awarding of research grants by the Australian Research Council, um, aligning those grants with the Modern Manufacturing Initiative. Do you have a perspective on? Um, what what the implications of that sort of shift are for the for the scientific community? Um, 
Senator, just just in uh, insofar as the, the priority areas in the in the modern manufacturing strategy, um, we we helped. We, we shared a lot of our information with the department on what we were seeing in terms of you know areas of strength in Australia and areas that Australia might need. So those priority areas do align fairly well with what we think the priority will be for the need of industry. And given that, then universities should find it a bit easier to commercialise their discoveries in those spaces because have a, a, a bit more a bit more interest, a bit more pull from our industry to support. Okay. Okay. The thank chair you. is winding me up. Thank you. Th thank you, Senator Walsh. And, and look, I just want to do some quick housekeeping before I go to you, Senator Roberts. Uh, I don't have any questions for the Office of the Chief Scientist or the Australian Institute of Marine Science. Uh, Senator Walsh, did you have any questions for them? Because uh, ideally I'd like us to uh, be able to complete... I've got a few questions for the Office of the Chief Scientist, but not the Institute of Marine Science. Okay. All right. So I, ideally we, we have to finish at 6.30. It's a hard marker. So. Um, Senator Roberts, I'll go with you, and if you can be as quick, you've been terribly patient as you always are, if you could uh, be as quick as you could. Thank, thank you. you, and thank you all for attending. My questions are going to be initially to the uh, Minister, and, uh, and then, if there's time, to the Chief Executive of CSIRO. Uh, Minister, referring to the government's change in its 2050 net zero policy, in the 2019 election, the government's opposition to the UN's 2050 net zero carbon dioxide policy gained you many votes and a lot of political traction and used them to you use the the policy to uh, labor's adoption of the policy to really smash the opposition leader bill shorten just two years later after emphatically re repeatedly and thoroughly criticizing labor and the greens there was an unexplained reversal last year and the government adopted the un's 2050 net zero carbon dioxide policy what is the specific change in climate science on which the government's change of policy is based uh, well, thank you. Um, I think I think to answer that question in detail, I think it would probably be um, best for the Environment Minister. Uh, but um, I, I would simply say that I don't accept the premise of, of all of what you've said. Uh, what in do terms you disagree of, with? Well, you said unexplained. I mean, obviously, we went through quite a detailed process. Uh, the Prime Minister um, uh, spoke uh, on a number of occasions about his desire to uh, get to a net zero um, position if it can be done in a way uh, that protects Australian jobs uh, and continues to see industries thrive. And that's what Minister Taylor worked on now. We're not obviously in the space where we have the, you know, the detail in terms of those portfolios, but um, it, it was explained over a period of time. The government made the decision. Obviously, it played out um, publicly. Where there was a conversation, I think, with the Australian people, and, and obviously there was a, a live debate that you were aware of uh, that, that the coalition went through and the government came to a conclusion. Okay. Um, it wasn't explained in terms of some change in science. There was no references, there's no document, no publications referred to no specific page numbers of the change in, in the data or the, the cause. So there was nothing to change the policy. Well, as I say, um, the government um, was not prepared to commit to such a policy without being able to uh, do the work uh, as to how we would get there and how we would do so in a responsible way. And that was the, the job that Minister Taylor in particular was tasked with. Um, and, and that was the, the work uh, that fed into the government decision. Now, um, in terms of, you know, um, the detail of the various portfolio parts of that. Um, I think that's probably for another part of estimates, but I think that okay. so, I think that summarises uh, the government's position. Well, let's go back a step further. What's the basis of the government's climate policy and ensuing policies on consequent policies on energy, agriculture, manufacturing, social policy, and other aspects that the UN's climate and associated policies impact? What's the, what's the overall basis? Sorry, um, I might just get you to repeat that question. Sorry. What is the basis of the government's climate policy and the consequent policies that stumble on from that on energy, agriculture, manufacturing, social policy, and other aspects that the UN's climate and associated policies impact? Well, look, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly broad question. I might it is. Ask, I might ask officials if they can, um, if they can assist. Uh, thank you. 
Yeah, so Ms. Evans. very quickly, Joe Evans, Deputy Secretary in the Department and uh, Senator, the basis is really the globally agreed science on climate change, which is articulated through the International Panel on Climate Change uh, reports. Intergovernmental Panel on Climate That's Change. That's the one, yeah. Okay, thank you. That was nice and quick. Um, back to the Minister. Cutting human carbon dioxide has had huge costly impacts cutting human carbon dioxide output has had huge costly impacts across our society, especially on fundamentals for productivity and prosperity, for example, energy. Surely the only sound basis for net policy with such economic consequences is the specific effect of changing human carbon dioxide output. The impact, for example, of a, of a specified change in human output of carbon dioxide, what specific impact would it have on climate factors such as temperature, rainfall, droughts, wind? Then when that is the specific impact, then when the effect is quantified, only then can we do a cost benefit analysis of the costs of doing that and the benefits that come from that. And significantly, we can't do any measurement of progress as we implement the policy unless we've got that specific impact of carbon dioxide. What is that specific impact of carbon dioxide on various climate factors? Um, well, I'm happy, I'm happy for officials to elaborate, but I mean, in terms of in terms of what the government's approach has been, it has been to be part of um, the Paris Agreement, uh, so part of collective um, action across the world, uh, where we are doing our part, uh, and we've been doing that obviously with our emissions reductions to date, uh, which which have been uh, tracking, in fact, ahead of uh, many comparable OECD nations and many sort of comparable resource-rich nations such as Canada. So um, what would be the extra uh, impact but, of but, but if I can, But if I, can also, if I can also go to your question uh, and, and in the preamble to your question around, you talked about um, other economic impacts or impacts in relation to uh, higher energy prices and the like. What we've seen under our government uh, in the last few years is actually energy prices coming down year on year and coming down quarter on quarter. So uh, we as a government never um, look at these issues in isolation. Uh, we look at it as part of um, uh, that uh, collective response and, and taking our responsibilities to the environment seriously, but never taking our eye off the ball in terms of the need for affordable and reliable energy, for instance, uh, and that's something that we've uh, we've been delivering, and that's been our track record. So, Roberts, we've got to go to the office of the chief scientist at 6:25. So I know you did want to ask some questions to the chief executive officer of CSIRO. So I just wanted to thank give you. you that chance. Uh, thank you. So essentially, what you're saying, Senator Sajelja, is that um, your answer is the same as the one Senator Cormann gave me repeatedly when I asked questions in the Senate and wrote him letters. That was, we've got to do our part of global agreements. Well, I, I mean, I don't know if, I, I'm not aware of exactly what um, former Minister Cormann- that, that's, um, the, that's the gist. Well, as, as I say, I'll, I'll take, your, take your word for that. I, I, I can I show you his letters. I'm, sure, I'm not, I'm not disputing. All I'm saying is I'm not aware of exactly what um, Minister Cormann told you, but you know, my evidence, my evidence is, is the evidence I've just given. Assuming what I've said to you of Senator Cormann's evidence, uh, uh, responses, you're agreeing with it? Well, look, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult question to answer without seeing all the detail of what you've said, but I think okay. my, my evidence speaks for itself. Okay. Um, Bob Hawke's Labor government first introduced the climate topic in the 80s. Then in 1996, the Howard Anderson Liberal Nationals government first made it policy. On what specific quantified effect did they base that policy? Do you know? Well, look, I think you're talking about um, uh, history of, of before I was in this place. And so I would, uh, I would prefer without having been involved in those discussions, I'd prefer not to, uh, you know, I don't, I don't feel qualified no, I to give you a detailed answer yeah. okay. on that. Are you aware that the Howard Anderson Liberal Nationals government implemented their renewable energy target, that is gutting electricity and industry generally, that they stole farmers' property rights to use their land, and, and they did that deceitfully going around the constitution, section 51, clause 31, and that John Howard was the first leader of a large party to adopt an emissions trading scheme which John Abbott, right, uh, Tony Abbott rightly called a carbon dioxide tax. Are you aware of those major policies that are now still in play? And, and John Howard actually said that the renewable energy target has gone too far now. Well, but I, cer I certainly wouldn't accept your characterisation of um, some of those policies in the way you've framed them, and certainly in relation to those 
um, fine leaders of our nation that you've sort of characterised their policies in a certain way. So no, I wouldn't agree with that. So, okay, thank uh, you. Sorry, Senator Roberts. We, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Just got one, got to one go thing to the, follow up. Well, it's, it's got to be very quick. It will be, very quick. Are you aware that six years after being booted from office in 20, 2007, in 2013, John Howard admitted at a Global Warming uh, Skeptics annual address in London that on climate science he was agnostic, yet he introduced these policies? Um, no, I wasn't aware of that. But, I can tell uh, you that. But I, I am thank aware. you very much, Chair. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Thank Next you. time, so, uh, Dr. So, Marshall. Uh, thank you uh, for our representatives from CSIRO. Thank you for joining us today.